Hello, everyone. Uh, I want to thank everyone here for joining us today for this book release, um, Murder and Scandal of the 1930s by Jeff Adachi. You know, today is a day with a lot of emotions for a lot of us. It's a day of remembrance of just an epic uh, figure, uh, both locally and nationally. It's a day of remembrance, and it's also a day of celebration uh, for all that Jeff brought to the field of public defense, for all that he contributed um, to the, the efforts of racial justice, for really just how many people he lifted up along the beautiful journey that was his life. This is the 100th year anniversary of our public defender's office, and it's very fitting uh, that we're honoring Jeff today on in the 100th year anniversary of the office because of how much he meant in really uh, putting the San Francisco Public Defender's Office on the national map. It's also fitting that we're doing this celebration during Black History Month, because as we all know, Jeff was very committed to racial justice, that started a racial justice committee in our office and was always present at the Public Defender's Racial Justice events that we had. And, was very uh, committed to that. I think you'd be really proud of the efforts of the office this year. We've, we're sort of celebrating the 100th year anniversary. We did a public defender webinar a couple of weeks ago to educate legislators about the work we're doing. And of course, we're talking about uh, this book today. I know Phoenix is gonna be talking soon. And um, for those of you who don't know, one of the reasons that I was inspired to actually join this office was watching Presumed Guilty and seeing Jeff in that movie and seeing how committed he was and how he was able to humanize his client in such a be beautiful way. And also seeing Phoenix talking about the day-to-day -day adrenaline rush of um, people in the misdemeanor, in, in our misdemeanor unit. And I think the way he was able to bring the work that we do to the broader public is you know something that we're all just deeply appreciative of. And this is another effort posthumously that we have today. I'm just gonna look at a couple chap, say a couple of words uh, that resonated with me and that speak a lot about Jeff before I hand it over to Mutsuko. Everyone on this call who's a public defender knows how obsessed and committed Jeff was to the art of trial work. Uh, in the preface, he talks about, he says this, Criminal trials are modern day gladiator fights. Like the armed combatants during the Roman Empire, trial lawyers face off and fight for their respective clients' cases and causes. Instead of swords, they use their words and all of the skill they can muster to present the winning case and convince the jury of the righteousness of their client's position. And Jeff really you know, embodied that in our office, he brought that in his own practice and he was never more excited than to go across the street and see someone you know, delivering a closing argument or, or fighting a trial. Uh, as far as the, he was also his, a historian. Uh, the position of the public defender was created by the passage of the Foltz Defender Bill, an effort by California's first female lawyer, Clara Foltz, who spent over 25 years advocating for a public defender's office. The bill finally passed the state legislature in, 1921, and the creation of the San Francisco Public Defender's Office was approved by the Board of Supervisors that same year. And Mr. Egan, for those of you who haven't read the book yet, won 38 acquittals, get this, his first year in office, 38 trials and 30, 38 acquittals his first year by himself. Um, and as far as things sort of remaining the same, he provided special attention to individuals who were mentally imbalanced and argued they should be sent to state hospitals for treatment instead of being branded as criminals and imprisoned. And of course, as someone who was just uh, such a uh, epic fighter, um, I'm sure he appreciates the efforts of a relative of one of our of one of our panelists today, Vincent Hallinan, and, and there's a picture of him being held in contempt during the trial. And that's how, how much Mr. Hallinan was willing to bring it for um, his clients. He served a 24 hour sentence imposed by Superior Court Judge Frank H. Dunn, who declared Hallinan was noisy, obstreperous and in contempt, which for Jeff would only be uh, compliments. With that, I know we have a 
you know, a really rich panel today. And we're also going to touch on Black History Month today. I'm going to turn it over to Mutsuko, but again, just deeply appreciate it for everyone coming together today to honor Jeff and everything he meant to all of us. Thank you, Manu. Um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a personal background. People always ask me, when did Jeff have time to write a book? When he was running the PD's office, going to trial, working out at the gym, making movies, politicking, and had a daughter and a wife. Well, actually, this is his 10th book, and the truth is he was a master multitasker who wrote late at night. To know Jeff is to love Jeff. When he said to me, let's go to the East Bay and go to a nice restaurant, I knew that that meant we were first going to stop at the Berkeley Library to look at the newspaper archives about Egan for a couple of hours, dressed in heels and dinner dress and a suit, before we'd go to a fine Berkeley restaurant. When he'd hold my hand and say, let's go for a walk, it's a beautiful day. I knew that our walk would probably end up at Frank Egan's house in Ingleside Terrace, the neighborhood next door to our house, to see if he could meet the owners and nose around the property. As you know, Jeff used to send text messages and email messages at all hours of the night. But with me, he'd wake, up in the, wake me up in the middle of the night to see if I would read a chapter he'd finished. This book has many more memories for me than just the story of Frank Egan. Today on the second anniversary of Jeff's death, I just want to thank you for honoring Jeff in the 100th anniversary celebration of the office. Many thanks to public defender, Mano Raju, Mac Gonzalez, Chaku Wilson, Kathy Asada, Valerie Ibarra, Lislin Lacoste, Phoenix Streets, the 100th anniversary committee, Grizzly Creek Peak Press, and the esteemed panelists, Brendan Hallahan, Joe Engler, Tamara Apron and Megan Cassidy. On behalf of my daughter, Lauren, and myself, I'd like to thank you for making what would have been a very sad day for us, instead filling it with a few hours of happiness. We hope you enjoy the book. Now I'd like to introduce you to Mike Monson of Grizzly Creek Press. Grizzly Peak Press. Hi, uh, just very quickly, um, just want everyone to know, thank you for inviting me to be on this panel and sit in. Um, Jeff's Life meant an awful lot to us as publishers at Grizzly Peak Press. Uh, and just simply to say that if anybody would like a copy of the book, simply go to grizzlypeakpress.com and order a copy. And I will make sure that it's fulfilled and sent out to you. If it turns out that we just don't have the book in stock, you'll be hearing from me directly. Uh, I, am the, uh, I am the shipper, I am the receiver. So uh, with that, Jacques, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you and welcome again, everyone. Uh, and thank you, Mutsuko, and uh, for those wonderful words about Jeff. Um, for those who knew Jeff, Jeff was a person who believed in remembering our history. Uh, and Mano briefly touched upon uh, Clara Foltz. Um, and uh, in 1921, October 15th, as a matter of fact, um, Frank Egan was sworn in as the first public defender, thanks to Clara Foltz. Uh, it is Black History Month, and we want to honor our pioneers in the office. Uh, the first public defender was Fred Smith. Uh, Fred Smith was the first African-American attorney in the office. Uh, after World War II, he joined the Tuskegee Airmen and later went on in the office to become the uh, chief public defender. Um, and we honor his legacy uh, today. Uh, the first African-American female attorney in the office was Estella Dooley. Uh, and Estella Dooley uh, served in the San Francisco Public Defender's Office from 1966 until her retirement in 1992, trying numerous cases, including stints in mental health and juvenile. With that uh, being said, the office has a rich history of diversity and equity. Uh, we celebrate this uh, day the, it's a life celebration. Uh, Jeff was a person who um, couldn't wait till the 
100th year celebration. Jeff was a person who couldn't wait. And I say it, and I slipped up the other day and I said, Jeff was a black man and that was because he was. Uh, for me to be able to reach out and touch someone, Jeff was the only person who I knew that I could reach out and touch someone. And he would fight for the rights of not only poor people, the, uh, the men, folks with mental illness, but he always fought for black people. And in my mind's eye and many other San Franciscans and throughout the world, Jeff was a black man. Uh, with that, I wanna turn it over to uh, Lislyn Lacoste. Lislyn Lacoste uh, works in the Be Magic program. She's the director there. Uh, that program was founded by Jeff. Uh, they give backpacks out in the Bayview. It's a community organization. Jeff believed in the community. Jeff believed in poor people. Jeff believed in San Francisco and his programs still resonate today. Lislyn. Thank you, Jacku. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Jacku said, my name is Lisa Lacoste and I have the pleasure and honor of working with Jeff in my role as director of Be Magic, one of two magic programs. Jeff always said that he was in the business of putting a public defender out of business. To this end, 17 years ago, under Jeff's leadership, MAGIC, which stands for Mobilization for Adolescent Growth in Our Communities, was born. He intentionally invested both MAGIC programs in serving the historically Black neighborhoods of Bayview Hunters Point and the Fillmore, where the majority of the city's Black population still resides and who disproportionately make up those which our office sees and represents within the juvenile and criminal justice system. Through MAGIC, Jeff sought to improve the life outcomes for our young people and to strengthen their families and community ties. Wanting our public defender's office not only to be great courtroom advocates, but community partners who empowered black and brown communities in uplifting their voices and lived experiences as a catalyst for change in addressing systemic problems. Jeff is truly missed, but never forgotten. Some of my fondest memories of Jeff include him, you know, as Jack who said, being at the back to school um, backpack event, you know, taking off his suit jacket, rolling up his sleeves, helping us break down and set up for the event, um, passing out fruits and books to the tiny tots um, at our annual book fair, popping in at one of our youth summits, um, and the, um, you know, working with, um, sitting in at the youth workshops. Um, I remember one time he um, was mistakenly, um, you know, um, um, recognized, mistakenly um, talked about by one of our youth as assembly member David Chu and us as adults were super embarrassed, but Jeff, you know, quickly chimed in and was like, no, I'm the good looking one, <laughs> which was really funny. Um, and then lastly, two years ago on this day, we were celebrating the opening of Be Magic's office in the Bayview. Jeff always loved a good party, especially if Stevie Wonder or Earth, Wind & Fire were playing in the background. The joy that was felt as he was surrounded by community leaders and residents and partners, many of which supported the magic vision from the start, um, was felt throughout that um, afternoon. Um, and through us all, the, uh, and young people, his, his, his legacy lives on and his inspiration lives on. To share more about Jeff's legacy and Jeff himself, I've now turned it on, turn it to Phoenix Streets. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm gonna speak very briefly because everything um, everybody has said, I agree with. Everybody knows that Jeff was an amazing person, uh, a person with many titles, uh, many ways to describe him. Visionary, artist, leader, father, husband, son, friend, motivator, advisor. It, it makes sense that Jeff is Jeff is the motivating factor that he is because of, you think of his background with his parents being, with grandparents and parents being in detainment camps right around the same time in history where black people were being even more exploited here in America than now. But at the time, I think while his parents, grandparents, were doing in the, in the detainment camps, my 
great parent, grandparents and parents were being sharecroppers. And from there, you learn something from the, the parents learn something and they pass on to the children. And that is that everything can be taken away from you at any time by the government. And Jeff found a way to use the law in order to help people, to empower people. Uh, he, he did this with everyone, but I'm speaking particularly to black people because this is Black History Month that we're talking about. Uh, Jeff went so far as to even one year, we had a all black incoming public defender class. That is everybody that was hired at that particular point in time was African-American. It was something that I had never seen before. And hopefully I see it again, but it was, uh, it's something that that's how unique it was. It's just, I've only heard of it happening that one time, never ever heard it happening before. But that's how committed Jeff was to the black community. And while he was practicing, Jeff would go out to places in the black community where other people would be scared to go to. And he would sit down and he would talk to the client. He, he treated people with respect and dignity. Look at all the, at all the programs that he started. The uh, Mo Magic, <laughs> Be Magic programs, just two of the things that Jeff started. And we're talking about in, we started the Humphrey, um, our Humphrey objections and motions um, to push people for the, the, the force the courts to release people without forcing them to pay. Uh, that came about because of Jeff speaking to a, to a friend, I'm sorry, the family of a client who was not released. And because it was not released, that caused hardship for the family. Such hardship enough that it made Jeff emotional, the fact to the point to where he was crying. And he said that that should never happen. And we are going to fight and insist that this change, that there's, that people be not forced to stay in jail because they are poor. And in San Francisco, you know, poor equals black most of the time. And so with that, I want to thank Jeff. Thank you, Masuko, for being here. Very special to have you here. And thank everybody else. And please enjoy the panel. Thank you so much, Phoenix Streets. Hi, everyone. My name is Valerie Ibera. I'm the public information officer at the San Francisco Public Defender's Office. And it's a real privilege and honor to be a part of this office and also to be a part of this very special event as we celebrate our 100th anniversary of the office and also this book uh, that Jeff Adachi wrote and it was published posthumously, The Case of San Francisco Public Defender Frank Egan, Murder and Scandal in the 1930s. Uh, so the first public defender of San Francisco um, put on trial uh, in 1932. Um, and what's interesting to me is that, that that was happening at a time before even television. And here we are in 2021 having a webinar um, where folks can participate and watch from all over the globe. And so I wanted to let people know that we do have the Q&A uh, function in this webinar. So if you do have a question, you can pop it into that um, to the Q and A uh, at the bottom of your screen. We have some great folks who are working behind the scenes that will be seeing those questions come in. And then um, after our first about 30, 35 minutes of the panel, we're going to uh, start answering some of those questions. And so. Um, we did invite some members of the press today. So if you are in the media, uh, if you could please type in your name and your media outlet when you ask your question, so we can be sure to, to see those for sure. But we invite everyone um, 
to uh, you know, ask a question, engage with our, our panel today, which is a really unique group of, of folks who are connected not only to Jeff, but also to the history of this uh, historic case. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn this back over to Jacques Wilson, who's going to be moderating the panel uh, this afternoon and uh, thank everybody for being here. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, when I thought about today, I, I thought about uh, Martin Luther King uh, Jr. and his eloquent speech, The Drum Major Instinct. Uh, and Martin Luther King, and I want to put Jeff in this, said, I'd like somebody to mention that day that Jeff Adachi tried to give his life serving others. I want you to say on that day that I did try in my life to visit those who were in prison. I want you to say that I did try to love and serve humanity. Yes, if you want to say that I was a drum major, say that I was a drum major for justice. And that is the type of person, human being and public defender that Jeff Adachi was. Thank you, Mutsuko. Thank you, everyone. And now I want to introduce our distinguished panelists. First up, uh, we will have Matt Gonzalez. Matt Gonzalez is the chief attorney of the San Francisco Public Defender Office, famed trial attorney, former president of the San Francisco Board of Supervisor, an artist in his own right. And he worked with Jeff and was one of the first persons to read the Jeff Egan book before it was published. And you will be hearing from Matt. Next, we will hear from Tamara Apperton, uh, Tamara, it's always a joy to see her because I always think of fond memories in the office. Uh, she was our beat reporter for so long. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I love seeing you, Tamara. Um, uh, she was the director of communications for uh, Jeff and the office, and she edited some of Jeff's other works. Next up, we will hear from Under Sheriff Joe Amber. Uh, Joe met Jeff early on in his career while attaining his law degree. And also, Joe is the great nephew of Inspector George Angler, uh, who worked on the Egan case. And his name is mentioned in the book. And uh, George uh, investigated uh, the Jesse Hughes case. Uh, we're so fortunate to have him today. Uh, then we will hear from Brendan Hallinan, um, attorney Brendan Hallinan, who comes from a long line of famed attorneys, uh, Vincent Hallinan, Terrence Hallinan, uh, himself. I know Neil, his uh, other, the other Hallinan is also a, a public defender and has been a public defender. Um, and Vincent was the one who represented uh, Frank Egan. And we will also hear from Megan Cassidy. Uh, and she's the current crime reporter at the San Francisco Chronicle. And uh, I'm sure many of you have read many of her stories and we look forward to reading many more and hearing her valuable insight today. Uh, so we're gonna turn it over to Matt now. Um, and Matt, what we would like to know uh, from you is uh, a, a synopsis of the story Jeff's telling of it um, and the importance of this story and how it fits into the living history of San Francisco. So uh, thank you, Jaku, and it's great to be here with everyone. You know, I think um, Jeff's interest in this, um, in the Frank Egan story was not just that they were both obviously the public defender of San Francisco, but I think Frank Egan has kind of loomed over our office in many respects. Uh, he's both the first public defender and part of our rich history, but we know that he was convicted of murder and uh, spent uh, over two decades in San Quentin before being paroled. And so it's sort of a, a, a tarnished history, so to speak. The trial transcripts uh, don't survive, but Jeff realized that um, he could tell Frank Egan's story, the story of the trial, through the newspaper accounts, uh, the contemporaneous 
uh, accounts of the of the period. There were uh, at least four daily newspapers, if not more. They had um, the estimates or something like 50 reporters covering the Hall of Justice, which meant uh, a trial as um, um, you know, celebrated and kind of uh, exciting and notorious as this one would have all of these reporters competing with one another to try to get the story. And they would interview witnesses and they would try to try to get the scoop on one another. It was also a time where uh, the way trials were conducted was were very different, was very different. Um, for instance, the jurors' names were published in the newspaper. Their photographs were in the newspaper. Jurors, the voir dire process was publicly discussed openly. So it's very different than what we uh, think of today as a very cloistered process to try to keep the undue influence um, inserting itself into uh, the ultimate decision. Um, the uh, Frank Egan was elected public defender in 1921 when the uh, position was uh, created. Um, at the time, uh, he worked alone in the office and eventually that grew over the, that decade to include some other employees. But at the time of his arrest, in this case in 1932, it was common for uh, an attorney working in the public defender office to still be able to do unrelated legal work, like civil legal work. And in Frank Egan's case, he um, was uh, an executor of wills and estates for private clients. And it is through that capacity that he met the uh, victim in, in this case, uh, Jesse Hughes. Um, now, Frank Egan's co-defendants in this case included uh, Albert Tinnen, who he had represented in 1916 before the creation of the Public Defender Office. Egan represented him successfully in a robbery case. And then a few years later, still before the creation of the Public Defender Office, uh, he served as an alibi witness for Tinnen in what was a robbery case that went bad and turned into a murder. Uh, and he was convicted, Tinnen was convicted of manslaughter charges and was sent off to prison despite Egan's effort at presenting an alibi. Um, once Egan was the public offender, he campaigned uh, very uh, hard to get Tinnen released on parole and was successful in doing so uh, the year that Jesse Hughes uh, was killed. Uh, and then the third main player here is Vern Doran. He, is the, he um, was described as kind of more of a, a small time, petty uh, criminal is the way it's often described. And uh, he served as, uh, sometimes it's referred to as a bodyguard or chauffeur for uh, Frank Egan. So if Minot is still on, on the call, uh, be careful uh, who you select for these roles. Um, Tinnen, by the way, was also employed by the public defender after he got paroled as a process server. So it's not just the public defender in trouble here, it's a, a couple of other employees as well. Uh, Vincent Hallinan, of course, the defense attorney was already mentioned. Uh, the judge was Frank Dunn and the district attorney was Isidore Golden. Um, the, the fundamental uh, part of the story, I'll just say uh, quickly, is that uh, uh, there was a staged hit and run situation where Jesse Hughes is body was left out on the street to appear as if it had been an accidental hit and run. What had in fact taken place is that Tinnen and Doran had gone to her home and uh, uh, killed her in the garage of the home and actually run over her body with a borrowed automobile, which played uh, significantly in how the case ultimately was solved. Um, it's, a, it's a fascinating case. Jeff really uh, was able for the first time, I think historically to bring together uh, you know, this trial in a way because he relied on the very media sources that were so active 
in, in the time period. And, you know, having been through the Garcia Zarate trial a couple of years ago that had quite a bit of media activity, I can, I can say that I think it's nothing compared to what Vincent Hallinan had to cope with during um, uh, this trial, because um, in, in the early 1930s, I think if you just stop and reflect on what it means for uh, eager reporters to make a name for themselves and to advance in their careers, to be out there beating the bush and trying to check out uh, alibis and to interview witnesses. And in the early 1930s, dealing with a local celebrity like Frank Egan, when Frank Egan puts out the word that he wasn't there, he was over here, reporters could actually find people who happened to be crossing the street downtown who said, oh no, I saw Frank Egan on that day on this corner. Or, um, you know, it was that kind of level of scrutiny to activity that's just amazing. And, and it's hard to imagine uh, trying a case under that kind of uh, magnifying lens. Jaku, I'll send it back to you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, next, we'll turn to Tamara. And, and Tamara is uh, Jeff's director of communication for many years and someone who edited his previous uh, works. Can you provide some insight into Jeff's writing methods and uh, how he used the media as a mechanism for change, unlike any other public defender I've ever seen? Sure, thanks Jaku and thanks for having me. I love being back here with my public defender friends. Um, so Jeff's writing style was fast and furious. Um, he was a prolific writer. Um, he would, you know, I, I worked with him on some projects and I would, he'd be writing chapters faster than I can edit them. I'd get, uh, you know, three chapters sent to me at 2.40 in the morning. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I think Jeff was just a natural storyteller. Um, he told the stories in court, in court and uh, through his films and through books and uh, through the media. Through the media. Um, I think he really understood that uh, stories are how human beings understand things and how they understand each other. And um, he was very attuned to that. And it wasn't any particular medium that he, um, you know, felt strongly about. He could work in all of them, whether it was in front of a jury or just, uh, you know, behind a camera or just behind his computer at home. Um, I think Jeff, uh, in, in what, in the public defense world, I think there are a ton of stories that don't get told. And I think that that was really motivating for Jeff. Um, you know, you watch uh, TV, you watch anything from a British procedure, police procedural to, you know, reality TV or movies, anything, uh, true crime. And it is almost exclusively told um, through law enforcement. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a tried and true narrative, but it doesn't tell the whole story and it doesn't tell the whole truth. And I think Jeff was very motivated um, to get the work that he did and the clients that he represented to get that part of the story in there. And it, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't ever in a, in a do your homework way or a preachy way. He wanted to, it was very nuanced and he wanted to show um, the work that public defenders did in all of its, you know, sometimes gripping, sometimes frustrating, complicated, warts and all um, view. And, uh, and I think that that's what he did through this later, latest book um, and uh, through a lot of his projects. I mean, just like the Frank Egan story, Jeff knew that the good guys and the bad guys were all mixed up together. And um, I think he wanted to put stories out there that had a more nuanced, um, truthful picture than um, what you see in a, lot of, in a lot of things. And I think that um, that definitely showed up in the way he dealt with the media when I started working there as the public information officer more than 10 years ago. 
um, we were the only public defender's office that put out press release press releases when we won a case. Um, and, uh, you know, it was because that story deserved to be told as well. And it wasn't anything to be ashamed of. It was something to be proud of if, um, you know, if someone was overcharged or wrongly charged or there just wasn't enough evidence to convict them fairly. And, um, and a public defender was able to show that in court. Um, that was a story to be told as well. And I think it, um, I think it, help the public get a clearer view of what happens in courtrooms um, when one person has the, the, the force of the entire government coming down on them and um, how what they, what they read in newspaper headlines is never the whole story. Um, I think that that was very motivating for Jeff and I think that's part of why he was so prolific. Bruce. Thank you, Tamara. And, and uh, next, we want to turn to uh, Joe Angler. Um, Joe has a personal connection uh, to Jeff, as well as a family connection to this case. Um, additionally, uh, Joe uh, was a, a police officer for 20 years before his current position at the uh, Sheriff Department of San Francisco. And Joe, could you also share a little with us about how, how investigations are conducted uh, then versus now? Thank you, Joe. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Um, yeah, so yeah, like you said, currently I'm, I'm the undersheriff of San Francisco. I made the leap over last year uh, to work with uh, Sheriff Miyamoto. And, uh, but formerly I was, I was a police captain at Northern Station uh, also a homicide inspector before that with the San Francisco Police Department. And at Northern, I was fortunate to work, to see Jeff's work in the community uh, with all the great folks supporting Mo Magic and um, all the great kids that, that came through the program. So Matsuko and Lauren, I'm really happy to be here today to honor Jeff's memory and um, all the great work that will continue to live on uh, in the city. Um, also really quickly, I want to share as a police officer, I, I, I liked, I liked that image earlier of, of, you know, getting ready to wage war and go into a courtroom and both sides do the best they can to tell the story. And, um, but I also want to share an important moment in my life, uh, and, and a gesture, very kind gesture that, that Jeff did for me, um, I went to Knight Law School, San Francisco Law School, uh, for any of you that may have been fortunate, fortunate enough to go there. And it was a great school. It gave you what you needed. And it was at night. Uh, I'd work the midnight watch as a police officer and sleep during the day and go to evening classes before work. But I, I struggled, as many people do. My first shot at the bar exam, I didn't make it. And uh, so second time around, Jeff was teaching uh, a course on how to pass the essay portion of the of the class. So I, I, I knew who Jeff was, not sure he knew who I was, but I introduced myself to Jeff Cole and, and told him I'm a police officer and I'm trying to pass this exam. And he gave me his card and said, come to my office next week. Now this is before Jeff uh, had been elected to the public defender position. Um, so I go to Jeff's, Jeff's office, I believe it was on Sacramento street and uh, for three Wednesdays in a row, I would go and we would do two hours of essay writing in the office. I offered, Jeff wouldn't take a dime. It was just a kind gesture to a police officer he didn't know. So this idea of, of waging battle and war, um, what a kind gesture and a, a beautiful thing Jeff did. And, um, and we had a lasting friendship after that uh, and uh, would go to lunch uh, from time to time with Mac Gonzalez, another great friend. So I just wanted to share that, especially coming from a police officer, uh, that that just the kindness and uh, anyway, that that community spirit Jeff brought. Um, okay, so I don't want to side sidetrack myself. I I thought the best way to introduce this this detective character George Engler. I was a small small child when he passed. George Engler was the oldest 
of uh, nine children that all grew up in the Mission District and then later Noe Valley here in San Francisco. And so I did a little digging uh, into some, some documents and I talked to uh, George Engler's grandson, my, my, my cousin, John. And uh, so, so I, I, I thought maybe I'd uh, share a little bit about George because you never really hear uh, too much about these old detectives, just names that are being thrown around. Um, so, so if you would, uh, this, is, this is from really the obituary, but I thought it might be poignant. George Engler was a member of the San Francisco Police Department family and head of the homicide detail in the 1940s. Uh, he joined the department in 1925. Two of his brothers were police officers and a third was a firefighter. His son, George Engler, was a police officer who studied law while in the department, now heads a San Francisco law firm. Uh, his son, George, is still alive today. Um, Mr. Engler became a police inspector in homicide in 1929. With just four years in the department and within a few months, had solved one of the more notorious murders of the day. He was credited with doing the work that led to the conviction of a public defender who had hired two men to kill a woman and make it look like an accident. When Mr. Engler was made head of homicide in 1940, the police bulletin said, quote, we don't know where they could find a better man. He, was, he had solved many murders that made page one. So that's a shout out to Tamara and our, our press corps here. His brother, John Engler, retired as, depart as deputy chief of investigations. His brother, Joseph, retired in 1971 as head of the pawn shop detail. Thomas Engler, a retired cap, was a retired captain in the San Francisco Fire Department, arson detail. One of his sisters, Marie Dugan, lives in the house on Alvarado Street in Oe Valley with the seven boys and two girls in the Engler family grew up. They were children of John Engler, a sheet metal contractor, and Mary McFadden Engler. Engler left the department at 45 to buy a restaurant, Geno's, at Front and Clay Street, and another on 10th Street he called Engler's. Uh, Mr. Engler retired from the restaurant business in 1965. So I thought I'd give you a flavor of George and of all the Engler's, uh, and there was a lot of them back then. Um, George, George had this larger than life reputation among all my great aunts, uncles, and, and my grandfather, Joe. And uh, he really was that guy. He, he, he left being, uh, uh, he, was, he, led, led the, he was a lieutenant at the homicide detail. When he was done with that, he went on to open restaurants. He was a pretty social guy, South End Rowing Club member. He would swim in the bay. Um, so there's that. That's, that's the family. And, and our family, incidentally, that, that piece about my great grandfather being a sheet metal worker, um, he, he actually owned a business. They called it South of the Slot on the other side of Market Street, South of Market. And uh, he's adding on to this new home he built for his family in Noe Valley. A beam falls, strikes him in the head. He lingered for a couple of weeks and died, leaving a widow and nine kids. So this George character, my great uncle, um, was literally paying for the younger children. My grandfather went to Sacred Heart. He, he actually helped his widowed mother uh, raise the younger children. And so kind of all, all these anglers had really interesting uh, 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 lives after that because they went from being a fairly well-off family to having nothing. Um, which means, leads me to the question about police work. Um, you know, police work today and police work then, I, I think there's more similarities than differences, especially in this city, in this town, really, that's, that, 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 that is just a small city. Um, knowing one another is the important thing. And so I, I brought this thing up about these family members and there was nine of them and you had three cops, a firefighter, a Catholic priest, the assistant postmaster, an attorney for the board of supervisors, an accountant for the railroad, a school teacher, you know, and then they all had big families. So these, these Englers back in the day um, were fighters also, much like, much like uh, a few fighters in the Hallinan family, I know. And, uh, you know, they, they, they were out there, they knew the people, they worked hard, they did the little things. Um, and, and that was one thing I was raised with. 
was you're an angler and we're workers, you know, we just work hard. And I, I think, uh, I, I, I think when we, we, we look back, I of course can't know the personal story of the investigation itself other than, uh, you know, Jeff's great research for the book. And, uh, you know, it makes sense doing the little things right are the things that, that lead to success. And, and, and I think lastly, I'll end this piece. I think the most important thing we can do is care about people and care about people, especially here in San Francisco. So as, as when, you, when you care about people, you see people. When you see people, you can figure things out. And I, I like to think that's what happened, uh, where, where, where truth came out, because you know, my family were, were, were very much the fabric of this city, and I'm trying to instill that in, in my own children today. Um, and, I'm, and I'm really honored to be a guest here today. And, um, and I like to think that I'm keeping that legacy alive working closely with the public defender's office on, 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 on small tweaks, on doing things to care about the community. Um, it's interesting being a sheriff. Um, the, the most rewarding thing we do is take handcuffs off, if you think about it, right? Because if we can get people through some solid programming and reconnect back to the community, um, that's also another important part of our job. So, well, thank you for having me on the panel today. And, it's much appreciated. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Uh, and next, we're going to hear from Brendan Hallinan. Um, obviously, uh, Joe just mentioned uh, you, your family's uh, story, legacy in the city. Uh, can you share some of that with us, Brendan, as well as what it's like to be the grandson of Vincent Hallinan um, and a part of the Hallinan? Uh, legacy in San Francisco. Uh, yeah, of course. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I uh, want to say thank you to Matsuko and Manu and the rest of the organizers and panelists for having me. It's really an honor to participate in this event. Um, after hearing this Egan story my entire life and reading my grandfather's news clippings and reading about stories in, in books, reading about this story in books, the family books, I didn't really know what to expect when I started it, but I right away I found it really enjoyable and easy to read. And so I commend Jeff on his work. I think it's really impressive that he was able to piece together such a good story uh, from such a long time ago and come up with, with just great detail uh, without a court transcript and relying only on newspaper accounts and various articles and books. And obviously I can't imagine there were many firsthand witnesses that he could have interviewed or that, that could have contributed as this was, uh, I think in the early 1930s and you know as someone who's lived in San Francisco all my life and comes from a family of criminal defense attorneys of course starting with my my grandfather Vincent my father Terrence Hallinan my uncle Butch Hallinan uh, my cousins Kate Hallinan and Neil Hallinan who was mentioned earlier who still practices criminal defense work here in San Francisco um, I really enjoyed reading a true crime story with the San Francisco uh, in the as the background um, particularly on like the parts of the city that you don't always think of unless you, unless you're a local, so to speak, like, uh, you know, the El Rey theater on ocean Avenue, which is, which is still there. And they just put a big piece of artwork in the front that says El Rey, kind of a throwback, which is cool. And, and they refer to the new Ingleside district where Egan had his home, um, right around the corner from the discovery of the victim's body or a few blocks from the discovery of the victim's body. And, um, I think the story did a great job of really bringing, bringing the readers back to 1930 San Francisco, you know, as, uh, as Joe just said, I mean, imagine a, or I, I believe Matt, imagine a, a detective locating a murder car uh, just based on a single eyewitness account at night within 24 hours um, parked in a downtown garage in San Francisco with uh, nothing more than the tire tread to go off of. Right. And uh, the number of, of witnesses that, that they were able to find, to really uh, pin down the story and, and add a lot of color to this trial. And, you know, when looking back at, um, at this story, one of the big questions that really jumped out at me when I was reading this book was, was uh, why did Egan choose Vincent as his attorney? Um, I think Vincent, obviously now he's got a big reputation, mm -hmm. but at that time he wasn't yet the lion in court, which he would later become. And at this time, he was relatively inexperienced, and particularly in cases of this complexity and, and magnitude and public scrutiny, 
And uh, as I was thinking about it, what occurred to me, or the more I thought about it, what occurred to me was that Egan and Hallinan shared a few values. And I believe uh, Jeff Adachi shared these too. They were, they were compelled to represent the underdog and um, you know, the less, less, less privileged of society, you know, all three of them. And, and they enjoyed bucking the system and standing up to, uh, to the powerful forces in society. I know Vincent, I remember as a kid, Vincent was always, he was always cynical in his work. And he would, he would, he wouldn't always trust that the government would do the right thing when it came to prosecution. And, you know, I remember him telling us, you know, that the government would pursue prosecution at all costs and not always with regards to the facts um, or to justice. You know, I was 10 years old at the time, so I didn't quite know what he was talking about. But looking back now, it, it makes a little sense and knowing, knowing these stories and, um, I know that this was his impression of the case too. I, I did a little additional research as well when, when after reading the, you know, the case of San Francisco public defender Frank Egan, and um, um, and I think that, uh, you know, his suspicion in this case was really heightened uh, by the fact that Inspector Dulea was able to just collect so much crucial evidence in such a short amount of time, and uh, I know that he had to drop everything else he was doing at the time because the case. Uh, was moving so fast um, that he couldn't handle doing any other work. Um, every day there was news breaking, and and if the uh, if the detectives weren't getting information, uh, the newspaper reporters were. And I think a lot of this cynicism bore out later when they found out that, uh, in fact, the uh, police had had heard Egan boasting of his plan to kill uh, Miss Hughes on a wiretap, um, and they failed to protect her. But they were adamant to not let Egan get away and escape, uh, escape this prosecution. Um, uh, you know, what was also clear, and I think one of the other reasons why Egan hired Vincent was that he really needed an advocate that would fight tooth and nail for him and would challenge the government at every turn as aggressively as if the attorney were fighting for his own life. And I believe Egan saw this in Hallinan, and I think he was correct. Um, Vincent, as mentioned earlier, Vincent ended up serving 24 hours um, in the middle of the trial or near the end of the trial. And in fact, wasn't uh, wasn't with Egan when the verdict was read, which I'm sure Egan would have preferred had he had been. But I also am sure that he uh, he appreciated that fearlessness uh, that Vincent advocated for for him with. So um, although although this case came early in Vincent's career, I think it, it established his reputation you know, as a ruthless fighter and a tough fighter for his client's rights and, and liberty. And despite the fact that Egan was convicted, he never blamed his attorney. Um, and in fact, um, I found out later on through reading a, a book called The San Francisco's Hallinan, Toughest Lawyer in Town, that um, not only was uh, Vincent um, held in contempt of court, but uh, he was later uh, indicted, tried and acquitted of witness bribery as a result of um, his representation of Frank Egan in this case, uh, which is, you know, which I wasn't even aware of until uh, until a couple of days ago. And uh, I tried to do some research on that issue, but couldn't find any. But that, you know, the fact that he was, uh, he took that kind of a hit um, for his client and obviously, you know, you read the book, you see he was standing up to the judge every step of the way, and he seemed to really believe in his client and not, not believe that his uh, his client could commit this crime, not the not the man that he knew as Frank Egan. Um, so those those are my impressions of the book. I thought it was very exciting, and again, I I was really impressed just with how um, how Jeff was able to create such a, a fun, easy reading book uh, that was so exciting and was uh, you know based again not on a ton of firsthand information, but was very factually detailed. And, uh, and again, was just based on, you know, secondhand accounts from newspaper reporters and, and various books and articles that I'm sure he had to search through the, uh, the archives to discover. So that was my impression. If I'd be happy to answer any questions at the later on at the Q and a session, if, if anybody has any for me. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. Uh, next, we're going to turn to uh, Megan Cassidy, uh, Megan. Uh, as the current crime reporter for the San Francisco Chronicle, what stood out to you about the journalism of that day compared to how you cover stories and trials now? 
Um, right. Yeah. I mean, the, the first thing that, that really struck me was just the, the sheer number of resources that the papers were able to dedicate to this coverage. Um, it said in the book, as I think was previously mentioned here, that there were about 50 reporters covering the trial each and every day, including a small army from each of the city's four major newspapers. So, um, you know, now in San Francisco, we still have several publications as well as TV news and radio crews. Um, but, uh, you know, it's no secret that resources are incredibly tight for each of them. And so we are, um, you know, whether we're a crime reporter or an education or health reporter, we're spread out really thin uh, across a, a lot of different stories. Um, but, and so like it, even today, some of the biggest cases, we wouldn't have this gavel to gavel coverage and especially they wouldn't send four to five reporters out, um, you know, one of the most recent examples of a huge trial here today was the uh, the ghost ship case, uh, where two men were accused of involuntary manslaughter were in Oakland after 36 people died in a warehouse fire. And so, you know, it, it would draw that kind of coverage on opening arguments and closing arguments uh, and the verdict. Uh, but I think it'd be really rare for any case today to uh, see that number of people, uh, I'm sorry, of reporters daily. Um, you know, another thing that I think was was pretty striking is um, you know how uh, sensationalized I guess they they got to they a lot of the reporters got in their writing um, you know newspaper headlines had had exclamation points on them and uh, some of the copy was I think a lot more editorialized um, in you know in ways that you know I think aren't you know positive or negative but. In a murder case today, I think uh, you would just want to be a lot more careful with your words, uh, not really take any liberties. But um, the writing back in the day just, you know, just reminds me of this romanticized uh, uh, view of newspaper writing that uh, shows that it's not just in movies. It really, it really was the case here. Um, and you know, I just noticed how much fun the writers seem to have with this story. Um, you know, in a way that I think that may be viewed as uh, tawdry or too opinionated today, but um, very, very interesting and, and fun to read. Um, and, you know, another thing I noticed that was interesting throughout the book is just the amount of access that the reporters got uh, that, that I don't think would have happened today. Uh, one that was mentioned earlier was the reporters knew the jurors' names and the, their identities and what they did for work. Um, and another thing was right after Frank Egan was uh, was found when he went to the um, the the asylum or the san sanitarium I think it was called um, reporters were allowed in and, and took photos of him um, so that that was something that was just uh, really striking to me as well uh, but yeah like I, I think Joe mentioned um, I actually do see a lot more similarities uh, with today and yesteryear that than I thought that I would see. Um, this, if this were a story today, it would be just as huge. Uh, you know, reporters would be fighting tooth and nail for uh, for each scoop. Um, you know, we we would be jockeying to get into the courtrooms. Um, you know, I, I've even found myself getting uh, a little bit jealous of the reporters that got to live through this and the camaraderie that you get with all the players in the trial. Um, you know, you kind of see some similar characteristics with the bombastic defense attorney and then the cool and collected DAs. Um, and, you know, I, I did find myself keeping score of the scoops that like the Chronicle got versus the examiner. I think the examiner got more scoops in this story, but uh, I think the Chronicle would have given them run for their money today. But, um, you know, overall it was just, <clears throat> it was super interesting to read, especially from somebody not, I, I'm not, from San Francisco uh, originally, but uh, you know, it just gave me such a uh, vivid slice of the city's history. Thank you, Megan. Uh, and now we do wanna uh, open it up for a question and answer. Um, so folks, um, if you have questions, please put them in the Q and A and we will try to answer your questions. Again, uh, if you can, uh, the link was posted um, in the chat to purchase the book, Jeff Adachi, The Case of 
a San Francisco public defender, Frank Egan, murder and scandal in the 1930s. I'm on my uh, third read of the book, actually. Um, first time, I could not put it down. Uh, the second time, uh, it was in anticipation of this event. And the third time was just to check on certain things. It's a fascinating read. Uh, for those who are interested in uh, becoming attorneys or knowing anything about the inner workings of an attorney, what was so amazing is that Jeff wrote this almost as if he were a reporter himself covering the story. Uh, and so one of my questions um, that came in, and let me pull that up here, was um, Jeff retold this story and seems to leave some reasonable doubt and ambiguity as to Frank Egan's guilt. Do you think Jeff Adachi believed that Frank Egan was innocent or should we attribute it to his tendency to cast doubt as a defense attorney? Um, so uh, do one of the panelists wanna take that question up? So basically from reading the book um, and Jeff was a defense attorney for those of you uh, who may not know, a public defender. Uh, I see Matt's hand, you wanna take that question, Matt? Well, I, I can tell you I had, uh conversations with Jeff. And I think one part of the story um, that is alluded to in uh, his book is he believed Frank Egan might actually be a serial killer. Uh, there were other uh, women in similar situations who had mysteriously died. And of course, the part of the story that I should probably just fill in is that Egan, because of his work doing wills and trusts and estates, often managed those uh, trusts and estates for these women and often was the sole beneficiary uh, because he befriended these individuals. And so when they died under mysterious circumstances, um, you know, there are probably a couple of instances where it can, it, it looks uh, obviously the Jesse Hughes case was, he was, uh, Egan was convicted of murder, but there's at least one other very credible uh, likely um, uh, possible murder there. Uh, the other thing I just want to say to Megan, I, I liked your, your point about, you know, who got the more scoops, but I think the current Chronicle, you could, it is actually the examiner. Today's Chronicle is the old examiner because the, the uh, editorial board, right, shifted over, mm -hmm. what, 20 years ago or something, so. Thank you, uh, Matt. And, and, and Megan, on that point, um, you also heard Tamara mention that sometimes it appears that some of the newspapers are uh, law enforcement oriented. Um, and do you think that is because public defenders are reluctant to reach out to the media or is it that the media is reluctant to reach out to public defenders or both? You know, I, I think back then, pro public defenders are probably a lot more uh, reluctant to reach out to media. But, um, you know, what, what I found in, in San Francisco and in the other cities that I've reported in, um, sometimes the public defenders are, are my best sources. You know, maybe they won't always speak to you on, on the record um, because they can't, but they are very true advocates for their clients in any way possible. And, you um, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if they talked to the media, uh, but you didn't actually see them quoted. Thank you, thank you. Um, and then we have another question um, and, uh, and I'll ask the panelists this, uh, is anyone looking to make this a movie or it, at least a lifetime movie? Um, we don't know of any movie uh, making deals at this point. However, uh, last week through the Adachi project, um, there was a movie released called 111 Taylor. So maybe we can talk to folks about maybe piecing together something about this. It, it was a captivating story. Um, and it would be interesting to see if there were um, any documentaries on, on this. Uh, the follow-up question, it looks like there is, and if someone else knows about any movies or documentaries, I know that uh, Joe Engler, uh, there was a question posted to him and he said the, the young man there with the bow tie on behind him 
uh, that is George Angler uh, there in the photo. Uh, so when you see uh, Joe come up again, uh, the gentleman in the uh, bow tie is George Angler. Um, but a question was, I find it interesting there was such transparency around jury identity back then and how shrouded in secrecy it is all now. As a deputy public defender myself, I am curious about your opinions as to why it's become so private, if that is hurting us defenders and if we could advocate to go back to the golden ways or olden ways days and have jurors be a more public force in a trial. Brendan or Matt, you wanna take that up? Brendan, you wanna take it? I'm happy to share thoughts, but. Yeah, go ahead, Matt. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I suspect that you know, one of the key things that we're interested in is a jury that can make decisions in a way that isn't influenced by uh, community sentiment or outrage, right? So we actually tell jurors not to read the newspaper, not to dialogue with family and friends, because you are hoping that the decision would be really the four corners of the, of the testimony that's heard in the trial. That's, a, that's an ideal that I think is rarely achieved, in t certainly in today's age of social media, et cetera. But I think that's, that's the intention. Um, anecdotally, I remember hearing when I was in lo law school that the uh, original juries centuries ago, that to be on a jury, you actually had to know the litigants because the theory was that you would be more likely to be able to assess who was telling the truth or not because you knew them, right? And of course, that would only work in a very small community. Um, I think, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I was quite, I was just quite struck at um, this phenomenon. I don't, I, don't, I don't know how it necessarily impacted the outcome in this case, but a lot of the banter of the Wadir you see the personalities of uh, Isidore Golden. You see uh, Vince Hallinan's personality because some of the exchanges with the, with the prospective jurors um, are literally being published in newspapers. And, and it's certainly just a completely different era. Thank you, uh, Matt. Um, for those of you, again, I want to remind folks that this. Uh, Black History Month, and Jeff was quoted as saying, for public defenders, Black history cannot be ignored. It matters to the work we do every day. Um, and I want to direct this question to um, Joe, as well as Brendan, uh, because I actually uh, listened to the audiobook Season of the Witch this, this weekend as well. Uh, and then Jeff's uh, book captured a lot of old school uh, San Francisco. Uh, and then it was amazing that you, Joe and Brendan could actually pick up a book and read about your ancestors like a hundred years ago. I mean that, and Joe, I think you were saying you wanted to pass that legacy uh, to your children. I, I know in the book, um, Jeff mentions a gentleman by the name of Arialis Alberga, an African American man who was a local celebrity. He was the first black officer in the US Army businessman and helped organize the San Francisco uh, NAACP. But for you guys, um, I mean, you know, Joe, you're, 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 you got a hundred years of history almost in the, the force or law enforcement. Brendan, your, your story, your family's story is so intertwined with uh, the public defender story in a hundred years. Can you guys share some about what it is to pass legacy down to the next generation and to be able to pick up a book and like read about your ass. I mean, that, that was what was, I mean, it's like you guys get to read this book and pick it up and see these folks who you knew. Like, can you share a little on that? Yeah, sure. If you want, sure, I'll, I'll jump in real quick. Sure, Brendan, you go ahead. Thanks, John. Yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, one thing my grandfather uh, did, was you know, really, really good about was he's created scrapbooks and he had the, all these volumes of scrapbooks of um, newspaper clippings from his cases from the cases and, you know, sporting events, things like that of all my uncles. 
Um, and so growing up, we always had these big, and we'd go over to grand, our grandparents' house every week for dinner, and we would go through their big scrapbooks. My grandfather would take us through stuff, you know, in the 1930s and, and you know, around the time. That's why I referenced earlier that I was familiar with this case because this was obviously, you know, this was a huge case at the time, and there was a ton of press coverage. And, and I remember going through the, you know, the scrapbook and being able to talk to him about that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really great. I think, you know, it's pretty rare in San Francisco. You know, I think, uh, I mean, I'm raising my family here and it's, it's just, I have three young kids and it's just extremely challenging to do it. We're determined to do it. Part of it is because of that legacy. Um, but it's, it's pretty cool. And I think particularly in a city like this, where you just have so, you know, each generation it's less and less. And, uh, and so when I'm able to kind of come to an event like this and participate in it and, and talk about that legacy and the fact that what Vincent was doing, um, you know, 90 years ago impacted, uh, you know, the people that are on this panel today and, and uh, other families throughout the city and, and the history of San Francisco as well. I mean, um, you know, the, the, I think with the, with the constant evolution of the city, um, you don't see a ton of historical um, stuff that you actually have the context for just because, you know, it, it changes so fast and there's so much, there's so much going on here, but um, reading season of the witch was really also an eye opener. It, it blew me away, you know, about the, the stuff, not only my grandfather did, but my father, my father was involved with and, and uncle. And, you know, I grew up in the seventies um, and early eighties. And I remember a lot of that stuff um, from the season of the witch. And now being an adult, looking back on it, you realize um, just how, uh, how impactful all those events were really on the, on the world. Um, not just on San Francisco, but, um, this is such a dynamic city and, uh, you know, a, a leader, uh, in a lot of ways of the nation and, and, uh, people are aware of what's going on here with trendsetters and so forth. So it's pretty cool. And I'm, and I'm really, really proud that, uh, you know, a couple of generations before me were able to, you know, make their mark in the city. And, you know, I'm, Hope that you know myself and my kids and the re my cousins and so forth have the same opportunity and, and hopefully leave our mark as well and leave the city city a little better than it was when we got here. Thank you, thank you, Joe. You got some insight on all of this? Well, <clears throat> a few thoughts. I mean, you know, I think San Francisco. I mean, is definitely. I mean, when, when we look at Jeff's book and 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 you look at the season of the witch and San Francisco is a character in the book. Uh, and that's the unique thing about San Francisco is, is this character that our, our city, you know, our beloved city takes on. It's a neat place. Um, just a couple of real personal stories just to go backwards. Um, when we spoke earlier, uh, Megan, when, when, when you remarked that, you know, some of the old ways apply more than ever now, as far as these relationships, uh, a few things occurred to me and we probably won't know, but I thought about Frank Egan being a police officer before he went on to become an attorney and how did information move so quickly? Uh, how, how, how did George Engler know where to go find the car in the garage, right? And who's talking to who? And uh, it makes you wonder, right? Because if, if Frank Egan's in a tough spot, who's he going to talk to? And you know, who, who tipped off Engler? Granted, there weren't as many cars back then to look for, but uh, pretty interesting to find the right one that quickly. So I don't think that's changed. We're still, um, you know, everyone's probably, you know, in, in, this, in this town, two or three people or, or, or these days cell phone calls away from the next person or text messages. We're pretty connected. Um, the other thing that, that, that the character of this city um, my grandfather ran the pawn shop detail and I've become close with the grandchildren of the people that he would do the pawn shop detail with. And today uh, I've spoken to young cops and they don't get it. Um, everybody's just doing their best. Everyone's running businesses, um, pawn shop details. They're right in the middle, right? In society, if you think about it, especially during tough times, but wonderful, beautiful people. And, you know, some of our old traditions we, we, we've gotten away with, uh, get away from, excuse me. Uh, the, the guys that, uh, you know, the families that ran the pawn shop details back then used to host and they move around a monthly lunch 
So all the police inspectors that work burglary and pawn shop would go to lunch with the pawn shop uh, owners. They'd shut down on a Friday once a month. And I mean, that's old San Francisco where everybody reaches across the aisle and works together. And so I, I, I do think that, that it's important to note that um, really our history is important. Our connectedness is important. Um, having friendships and really every office and every walk is extremely important because that's how we really do get things done, move the needle and all that. And I, I really kind of live that. I, I believe it. Um, I'm proud to say, you know, Matt Gonzalez, who, who asked me to be on this panel is, is one of my closest friends and one of the smartest guys I know. So, so just this idea of all of us working together among disciplines. I mean, um, again, that's what I think why they call, you know, they call this a small town forever. So just a few impressions. Great, and, 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 and thank you. Uh, I also wanted to point out uh, that uh, Vincent Hallinan ran for president of the United States in 1952. Uh, and his running mate was Charletta A. Bass, the first African-American chosen by a party as a vice president candidate. Long before Kamala Harris, there was Charletta Bass, uh, who ran alongside Vincent Hallinan uh, for, for president. Uh, we do have an, another question um, for uh, Megan. And Megan, uh, how do you balance publishing the details of a story when you know it could influence jurors? Oh, um, that's something that I just can't, I, I don't think about that at all. Um, that's uh, my, my job is to, uh, is to inform the public. Uh, it's it, it, with as much detail as we have. Um, it, you know, I, I think that it, it is uh, kind of unfortunate sometimes that they want jurors who um, don't know anything about the story. Um, I, I, I understand that reasoning, but also um, you're, you know, a, a lot of people, you know, enjoy reading the news, enjoy being, you know, up to date with current events. Um, and, you know, I think that it can be difficult sometimes to find people who, you um, don't know anything about the case and haven't made opinions yet, uh, but uh, it, it's a shame because a lot of times those are the most uh, informed and um, I, I guess thoughtful uh, jurors that you'd be discluding. Um, so yeah, the whether I'm um, influencing the jury pool really at all it actually has nothing to do with that with how I do my reporting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, we have a, another question and uh, I would address this to any of the panelists. Uh, at one point in the book, Jeff makes a point to mention another murder case happening at the Hall of Justice. I believe that's at the end of the book. Um, it's the murder, it is. It's the murder trial of a poor man of Asian descent. And he was brought into the courtroom in jail, clothes, handcuffs, etc. But Frank Egan was dressed in a suit every day and allowed to speak with family in the hallways, which points to two very different applications of justice, depending on stature and wealth. Why does that two tier system continue to exist today? And what can we do to change that? Who wants to tackle that? <laughs> Well, let me let me go brief because there's there's a lot a lot of great panelists here, but you know I, I do think law enforcement has a responsibility um, and, and and some control over over that piece. Um, I I can think when I worked homicide of of one man in particular that that was uh, going to be a witness actually for us on on one of the cases and and he'd been. Uh, arrested and, and was housed down in Santa Clara and we brought him back to testify on a, on a, on a murder case that he was a witness to. Um, but, but, you know, I took the time to go to the mother's house and I got him a nice, a, a nice suit. She bought him new shoes. He, he, he was really squared away when he went into the courtroom. Granted he was a witness, but um, I, I think this idea of what you can control, you should be, thoughtful and humane, respectful. Um, 
I think that's the narrative we need to move to today. Um, looking at, at, at the past, I think that's what we really need to learn from. And um, hopefully that as a society is the direction we're going to. So my, my two cents. Thank you, thank you. Um, and anyone else wanna tackle that, the question or I can move to the, the next question. Uh, and we have about uh, five more minutes or so for question and answer. So if you have uh, uh, questions, please put them in the chat. And Brendan and Tamara, I see both of your hands up. I like that function. <laughs> yeah, just again, yeah. real briefly. Yeah, I thought it was interesting, particularly when you take into consideration that uh, Tin and, uh, and Doran were both um, ex-cons um, and had been convicted previously. Um, I don't know the gentleman, it began, I'm, I don't want to butcher his name, but the man who was brought in in, in, uh, in shackles and so forth. I don't know if he had a record, but it seemed clear that in 1930, San Francisco, uh, there was a, a double standard. And, you know, I think that, uh, I think that now the difference is, is people are aware, more people are aware of the double standard, um, the institutional component to it. And I think that on the bright side, there are people working to um, repair and get rid of that sort of double standard. So it's, uh, you know, any, like anything like that, where it's, it's been going on for so long and it's ingrained in, in parts of the system and hidden in parts of the system, it's, it's, it's hard to fix overnight. But I think the fact that, that society as a whole in California is, and Californians are aware of this, I think that's, uh, that's a step in the right direction. And hopefully, you know, our, our government and the courts will continue to push to eradicate them. Thank you, thank you. And uh, Tamara? I would just add that um, um, getting equal justice, uh, funding the office that, uh, that, that uh, represents people without means properly would go a long way to reducing the two tiers of justice. Thank you, thank you. And then there was a, another question. Uh, in the good old days, 1930s, San Francisco, how many jurors were African-American, Chinese-American, Japanese-American, women, judges, attorneys, cops? Um, anyone want to tackle that? I know that uh, the first African-American uh, attorney, a female attorney uh, in San Francisco was 1932 or 1933. Uh, and then the first uh, African-American uh, a male hired at the San Francisco Public Defender's Office was in 1961, and that was Fred Smith, uh, who I uh, chronicled earlier. Uh, and then after uh, him, Estella Dooley was the first African-American uh, female. Um, but I'd love to uh, hear anyone's insight on that, if they have any inkling uh, if, of how many jurors were African-American, Chinese-American, um, how many women were practicing, I guess, or, and or judges, attorneys, and police officers. Anyone? I see Brendan's hand, go ahead, Brendan. I mean, the only thing I could add from the book was that there were women jurors. I remember they, they referred specifically to the one woman juror who seemed to be Hallinan's juror, that's how, that's how I recall. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't recall any other, any other uh, discussion and I, I don't think it's very likely that in 1930s it was a real diverse uh, jury pool, unfortunately. Thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, I know that uh, in the uh, documentary, um, Eye on the Prize, where uh, Emmett Till's uncle was testifying in court, uh, he was the first person to point out a, a white person in court, and that was in the 50s. Blacks were not allowed to testify. Uh, in the 2005 um, annual report that we had, uh, Jeff chronicle equity and diversity in, in our office. Uh, and he highlighted that in the, uh, the 1930s uh, that there were not um, uh, people of color uh, serving on juries uh, and that uh, they were not even able to be witnesses at that time. Um, so uh, that is a part of San Francisco's history and that is a part of uh, the United States history. Um, now, 
we're at the 130 mark. Um, I want to uh, have us uh, have concluding remarks. Um, so I want to go around uh, to the panelists and um, for two minutes or so, give your concluding remarks. Uh, and we'll go uh, reverse order this time. Uh, and so I, we'd like to hear uh, from Megan Cassidy. Hello. Am I on? Yes. I, um, yeah, well, I just, um, gosh, uh, I uh, thoroughly enjoyed this book. Um, you know, I think not just because I'm a, um, a crime reporter and I could kind of put myself in the, in the shoes of the other reporters, but um, it was just so interesting to be able to uh, feel like you're back in the 30s and uh, just see how exciting the, the trial would have been at that time. Um, it's a super fast read. Um, I'm again, I'm so impressed with uh, Jeff Adachi for putting this together, especially knowing that he was juggling like eight other careers at the time. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's such a fast read. The narrative's great. It reminded me of um, kind of of In Cold Blood, but without maybe taking so many uh, narrative leaps. Um, but yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I finished it in two days. Um, I would recommend it to anybody else in the city. Thank you, Megan. Um, and next we would turn to uh, Brendan. Brendan, concluding remarks. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks everyone. Um, uh, Jaku, thank you for um, keeping everything moving. Uh, this was a lot of fun to be a part of. Um, I think, yeah, what stuck out to me just, I thought, you know what, I like what Joe made that point about the city, this big metropolis being kind of a small town. Um, and even at that time, I mean, it was still a big city um, and uh, everyone was connected. Uh, Egan was running around, uh, you know, running a public defender's office and doing estate planning and yeah, going to the fights. And just, it, it, was, it was really fun to kind of hear how things, uh, how things were back then. And um, I think that it was exciting to kind of put yourself in that and, and the book being a real page turner, um, not too complex, but a, a cool complex set of facts um, was a lot of fun. And uh, I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed the read. Um, and again, I'm gonna go back and, and I, I did read a couple other articles about it after I finished that book to to brush up on some additional history. And there's a few nice articles out there. If you, if you Google it, there's some fun stuff to get into. And I'm gonna go back and look at the streets. And maybe next time I drive down Ocean Avenue, I might take a right turn and, and go up and, and check out the scene of the crime. And <laughs> so I go by there pretty often uh, as it is. So um, yeah, I think uh, concluding remarks is it was, you know, I think just wanted to, once again, just kind of Commend Jeff on his work, and and I guess also on his on his uh, life's achievements, and uh, congratulate the public defender's office on a hundred years. I think it's come a long way since Frank Egan was trying twenty eight cases a year by himself, um, and to the kind of the point of you know we're talking about the jury pool and the changes that we're making. I think in terms of justice and so social justice as well, the fact that the growth um, and success of the public defender's office is a good sign. Um, that we're going in the right direction. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. Uh, next, we'll turn to uh, Joe. Joe. Yes, thank you. And uh, following Brendan, uh, I, I would also like to say congratulations to the Public Defender's Office on 100 years. And um, uh, I've been on the other side of it. So definitely worthy adversaries. And uh, we all make each other better in the work we do. So um, congratulations. Um, and, and congratulations to Jeff. We all miss him, um, admire him. His ability to embrace so many talents. I mean, uh, fantastic attorney and leader, uh, author, artist, community advocate, educator, um, and a friend to many of us. Um, so. Um, I really appreciate being asked to be on this panel. It means a lot to me. And um, so again, thank you. And thank you, Jeff. The level of detail in this book, it, it really brought the times alive. And I think 
you know, he did, it, it was a job well done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Tamara. Thanks everyone. Um, I just want to say I really enjoyed the book. It was really fast paced and colorful and fun and smart. And um, in that way, it was very much like our friend Jeff. And it's just another very cool piece of his legacy and part of the huge uh, footprints he left. Um, and then I also just want to thank everyone at the Public Defend Defender's Office for having me on. Congratulations um, on your hundred years and for continuing Jeff's legacy and fighting the good fight every day. You guys are the best. Thank you, Tamara. Next, Matt. Uh, yeah, I, I want to, um, you know, I really uh, like those final questions because they make you think historically, you know, how people like Frank Egan and Vince Hallinan fought for the vulnerable, and yet they were also the beneficiaries of privilege. And it's, you know, it's, it's important that we keep that in mind. We still have further to go. I don't know if anybody mentioned it today, but Frank Egan, before he was an attorney in, in the public defender, he was a police officer himself. And that also was a whole nother layer of privilege as his old colleagues um, you know, were surrounding him in the courtroom and what have you. Um, you know, yes, yesterday in anticipation of today in this, this event, uh, I was reflecting on Jeff Adachi and you know, thinking about uh, his you know, really just immense contribution to my own life. And, you know, just uh, thinking about the positive um, experiences and memories I have of him. He fought a lot of important battles. He, uh, he really taught so many of us the importance of, of, of the fight and bringing everything you have to the fight. And uh, I think that this book reflects that. I think it's a it's a book that's a testament to Jeff. It's also a real testament to Vince Hallinan, who was willing to take this case. I think a lot of lawyers wouldn't have wanted anything to do with it. Um, and just factually, one last thing I'll, I'll say, I think it's, it's fascinating, uh, Brendan, that once Vince is held in contempt and jailed, it's the second in, in command in the public defender office, who's then the acting public defender, Gerald Kenny who is in the courtroom to represent Egan when the verdict comes in. And it's just so complicated because Kenny was called, I think as a prosecution witness to deal with, with some of the discrepancies and whether or not uh, Frank Egan was in the office that day or not. Anyway, it, it, it's such a fun book because it just crisscrosses everywhere. Uh, let's go, uh, wonderful to see you today. Thank you, Jaku. Thank you. And uh, that was the one of the le many lessons that I learned from the, the book as well, Matt, uh, because George, as you said, was called as a witness that any of us can be called as a witness at any given time. Uh, that was, mm -hmm. uh, you learned so much on this job. Um, but uh, I also uh, want to point out that, you know, Jeff uh, wrote a, an article and, and that was where I took some of the quotes from today uh, and why Black history matters to public defenders. Uh, and he said, public defenders must know black history to understand today's struggle against injustice. Public defenders must play a critical role in the movement toward equality and against mass incarceration, which disproportionately affects black and Latino clients. We can speak from a place of knowledge from the clients we represented and battles we fight every day. This is why black history and the struggle against injustice and oppression matters to public defenders, not just in February, but every day. And that is why it's such an honor to be a member of the San Francisco Public Defender's Office. I know that I'm in one of the most diverse uh, law firms in the nation. Uh, Jeff uh, made sure of that, Matt made sure of that, Manoa's made sure of that. Phoenix referenced the, 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 the Black Week where uh, there were nothing but Black employees hired 
And a lot of us black employees were like, is this Armageddon? Because we had never seen that in our <laughs> lifetime. Uh, and that's the type of public defender office uh, that we have that's ready to push the envelope, much like Vince Hallinan, uh, who was ready to be the defender's defender. And that's how the public defender's office looks at itself, is not only the defender's defender, but the defender of the community. Uh, and again, just an honor and a privilege to be here with such distinguished panelists to learn the history of San Francisco. I'm intrigued. I've ordered the book, uh, A Lion in the Courtroom, I think it was. Uh, and then the other book that you mentioned, uh, Brendan, I'm now fascinated in the history. Um, and that was thankful uh, to, to Jeff in reading uh, you know, this amazing book that he, he, he wrote. Um, I want to thank Mutsuko. I want to thank Lauren. I want to thank the 100 year committee. I want to thank all of our distinguished panelists. Uh, there will be a lot of other events throughout this year uh, where we celebrate, again, where we celebrate not only Jeff's life and what he meant for the office, but the 100 years of the public defender office. And again, I repeat, I can still see Jeff. He couldn't wait till the 100 year celebration. He was already planning that at the 90th celebration. And when we'd have these manager meetings, Jeff would be up there talking about the 100 years. And he was just such a, a, a person who enjoyed and loved history. When you walk outside uh, his office then and now Mano's office and Matt's office, there are photos of, of folks who played historical perspective in our office with the public defenders. There's been eight public defenders uh, in, in our office's history. Just a story legacy and a wonderful place to be. Uh, you know, with that, I want to also remind folks that you can purchase this amazing book. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just truly amazing to know that Jeff wrote the book, to be able to step in his shoes and see Jeff through another lens other than the amazing uh, trial attorney, the ferocious advocate, the movie maker, the community activist, you name it, Jeff did it. Um, even helping folks with the bar. I mean, just an amazing human being. Uh, you know, that being said, please purchase the book. Uh, no one's making any money off of this. This is just a historical book from a historical perspective, and it will be a, a, a piece that the Public Defender's Office cherishes forever. Um, that being said, uh, thank you again, everyone. And now we are gonna go ahead and turn it over to Valerie. Actually, Valerie, you there? I believe yeah, I'm we're going to turn it over to uh, Mano. Actually, actually, we're going to turn it over to Mano, our eighth public defender, uh, an amazing community activist uh, who's keeping this story history going on, uh, has been out in the community, has put on numerous events this month for Black history, has championed the 100 year anniversary, and I'm sure he'll mention but please watch 111 Taylor, the Adachi Fund Project, and keep an eye on the Public Defender's Office. Keep an eye on Mano. Follow his tweets. Get on his Facebook. Get connected to this movement. Uh, amazing person. Thank you, Mano, for allowing this event to take place today. Floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. for facilitating the discussion. Thank you, uh, Joe, Mutsuko, Megan, uh, Brendan, Valerie, Matt. Um, you know, much ago in particular, I know that it can be challenging to be here to deal with this, but on behalf of the whole office, really grateful uh, that you were able to join us today. You know, there was a question earlier about the two-tiered system of justice. I want to go back to the book uh, because I'm sure Jeff wouldn't want us to miss this piece. The defendants who met Frank he were probably immediately impressed with his appearance and dress, which, of course, Jeff was also known for, known for wearing finely tailored suits and colorful ties, Egan stately demeanor inspired confidence in the free lawyer. And I just bring that up because although we have to continue work on the funding piece, which Tamara mentioned, you know, we are really committed to making sure we're providing the top level defense we possibly can, even though it's for free, the best defense money cannot buy. And I know Jacques Poo has been particularly committed to the pretrial release unit. One of the, his clarion calls has been, look, if you hired a private attorney, they would immediately start working on your case. They wouldn't be waiting until the arraignment. And that's what we try to do here at the office. So I'm really proud of the office where we've come and we have a lot more work to do. Um, 
but you know, we're always uh, inspired by the legacy that, that Jeff brought and, that, and we continue to carry that on. Also want to just briefly mention the Adachi project um, as I see Mutsuko here who gave her blessing for that project. And it's really something that we're really trying to do to bring those stories out to the community to have a deeper understanding of exactly the struggles of our clients and the, the importance of the fight and the battles for our clients and their communities. And it's something we're gonna keep working on. Uh, we've, we have a you know, group in the office that's really put in a lot of work to make that happen. It's something we're very proud of. And I'm sure Jeff with his commitment to storytelling, his commitment to film would be, would be super proud of. So um, really hats off to everyone in the office who's been working on that and to our collaborators. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Valerie to, to close this out. Thank you so much, Mano, and thank you to all of our panelists this afternoon. Um, as a multi-generational San Franciscan myself, it was really a treat to have all of your voices here. And I, and I wanted to, I, I liked what, uh, what Joe said about this book is that San Francisco itself is a, a main character of this book. And so we're all part of this ongoing history uh, that connects us all. And, um, and thank you all so much. And thanks to the over a hundred and so people who, who attended this live and who are watching it on our YouTube channel at the San Francisco Public Defender's Office YouTube channel where uh, this video will also live and be archived. So uh, history in the making as we speak. Uh, I'm also posting excuse me, I'm also posting into the chat here um, for folks who are still here. If you do have follow-up questions, anything about this panel or our ongoing celebration of the 100 years of the Public Defender's Office um, or the Adachi Project, uh, the adachiproject.com and wearedefender.com uh, just recently launched, um, please do reach out to me. I'm happy to speak with you and answer your questions, um, set up interviews, whatever it may be. Uh, you can reach uh, our media team at media relations at sfgov, uh, excuse me, pubdef, P-U-B-D-E-F, pubdef-media relations at sfgov.org. Again, my name is Valerie Ibera. You can email me, uh, V-A-L-E-R-I-E dot I-B-A-R-R-A at sfgov.org. Org. Um, and we've also created a, a hashtag that's going to be used on our social media to celebrate our 100 year events. It's hashtag 100 year defender strong. Um, so do look for that uh, 100 YR defender strong. And thank you again so much. This has been so insightful and uh, an exciting day. And um, much respect to the entire Public Defender's Office and all of our panelists, um, and of course to Jeff Adachi. Um, so thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day and appreciate your participation. <laughs>